Hey you guys, I am back today to talk about control issues. I know almost every single person that I know is impacted by control issues, whether it's their own control issues or somebody in their family or their relationship. And mostly what I'm here to talk about is, you know, our dynamics in our marriage or our primary relationship. Um, but what I'm sharing today is going to apply to all of your relationships. So because this is such a huge pervasive topic, I'm going to share what that actually is when I talk about control issues. What do I mean by that? How do these show up? Where do they come from? Um, some different ways to think about these that I think will help us be more compassionate towards ourselves and also others that are struggling with this. And then also finally what you can do to transform your dynamics to get past the control issues so that you can get control and you can feel empowered without actually being controlling. So when we talk about um, control issues and people that have control issues, what I really mean is when if you or somebody that you know has the need to maintain power over nearly every aspect of their life, that includes obviously personal and romantic relationships, family dynamics, events in the workplace, things that they're doing, every, every part of their life that they're interacting with. If you notice that they feel like they have to be in control of that, <clears throat> that's obviously a sign that this is something that is going to become a problem. And so you want to really look at like what's at stake behind that and get curious first. Um, but I want to draw a distinction too, because for the purpose of this conversation there, and, and based on the work of Pia Melody, who I've mentioned before, she's done a lot of work on codependency. And that is that really overlaps with control issues and boundaries and things like that. She draws a line between positive control and negative control. So positive control is basically, you know, when you are determining your own reality, when you are owning your own choices, your reality is separate from the reality of others and you can stand firm in that. It's self-control, basically. Positive control is self-control. Controlling your own choices, making decisions based off of honoring yourself, uh, decisions based off of healthy self-esteem, and completely owning the power that you do have on your side of the street. Sometimes we're so focused on the other side of the street that we forget the power that we have on our side. Now, for this talk, what we're really talking about, the problematic kind of control is the negative control. And that's giving yourself permission to try to determine what somebody else, how they uh, present themselves in the world, how they look, how they think, how they feel, what they're doing, what they're not doing. On the flip side, it could also be if you're on the receiving end of it, it would, it would be a failure to determine for yourself how you want to present yourself in the world, how you want to feel or think or what you want to say or do, right? In, and instead, you're allowing somebody else to determine those choices for you. And you're really losing touch with what is right for me and forgetting that you have the right as a grown up to make those choices. <clears throat> so at, like as a quick example, like when I refer to controlling behavior, I'm talking about when you start to try to have behavior modification with the person that you're trying to control. This isn't always conscious. I just have to be really clear about this. Um, but it's like getting punitive, being punitive, punitive or punishing or retaliating against your spouse is, a, is an example of how controlling behavior might show up. And I'm going to get into this in more detail in a second. But for example, if I were to ask my husband, you know, that there's something that I want to be done and I'm asking him to do it. And I'm telling him, this is how I want it done. This is how, when I want it done. This is the way that it should be done. And then, and by the way, that in and of itself isn't controlling. It's not controlling to ask for what you want. Um, it's up to them to decide if that's something that they can do or not. But if he doesn't do what I ask and then I punish him for it by giving him the silent treatment or being cold or weird or mad or blocking connection or walling off, then I'm basically punishing him and saying, you don't get to stay connected to me. He has to choose between doing what I say on my terms which might be not, not honoring himself and staying in connection with me. And that's not a good choice to have to make, you know, being authentic to yourself and remaining connected to the person that you really want to, you know, be with. So that's an example of, that's kind of like a yardstick to say, all right, I'm asking for something. I have an idea of how I want it to go, <clears throat> but if I don't get it, is there going to be hell to pay for this other person? And if there is, that's, in my opinion, moving into controlling. Now, it's okay to be upset if 
they say yes to something, you have an agreement, and they don't hold up their end of the agreement, you have the right to give feedback around that and how that impacts you if you feel let down or whatever. But we aren't in control of what other people do. We're only in control of how we respond. So in terms of looking at like uh, other ways that this actually shows up, um, these are connected, all the things I'm about to share are connected to the core symptoms of codependency. So in other words, if you have low self-esteem, if you have poor boundaries, if you have difficulty really dealing with what is real in your life, if you have difficulty meeting your own needs and wants, that is a precursor to showing up with controlling behaviors. And it's not always overt. It can be covert. It can be through um, <clears throat> being in the one down position and still trying to accommodate or caretake. I'll get into that in a second, but sometimes we're trying to control something from the one down position where we don't, we're not getting heavy handed about it. We're not being explicit and demanding, but we are still trying to influence the outcome and our sense of well being is contingent upon that. So there are 10 things that Pia Melody talks about that are connected to um, control and codependency. She, and, and honestly, she does an amazing job. If you want to like do a deeper dive on this, I would look into her work, but she identifies these, the 10 common controlling techniques as a byproduct of our culture and as very much encouraged by our culture and especially for women, but this can work both ways. Number one is Im image management. So if you're trying to hide who you are, hide who your spouse is, <clears throat> try to control how others perceive you by, you know, how you're dressing, how you show up, what you say yes to, what you don't say no to, that's managing, you know, your image or managing the image of your partner. That's, that's a control tactic. Nagging, and I don't like the word nagging, it's a very gendered word, but I'll, I'll rephrase this. The repeated attempts to try to make something happen over and over again, like staying on top of somebody to get them to do something that you want done and not even giving any space for them to potentially disappoint you or to surprise, pleasantly surprise you because you're just on it all the time. If they're not doing it, then you need to take a step back and say, okay, why is that happening? <clears throat> did, they, did I not really get their buy-in and that's why it hasn't happened? Is there a pattern of broken agreements? What's really going on? But harping on someone and constantly trying to like influence what they're doing through repeated questions and that kind of thing, that's controlling. We've all done it too, by the way. Um, the, other, the third thing is being helpless. The idea of using vulnerability to get somebody to step in and take care of you, that could be an adaptive child state. It's almost like <clears throat> I don't feel comfortable asking for something directly so I'm going to play the victim or I'm going to be really help, helpless. I'm going to be very vulnerable if I feel like that's going to get, it's, it's like a, a manipulative tactic. And it's, like I said, it's not always conscious, but the deeper unconscious desire is to elicit a specific outcome, to get somebody to do something for you. You know, it could be that you really just want um, to, you know, have attention it could be an unmet need of childhood that you're trying to get met through your spouse. That's for you to decide. But being helpless is a form of control, which I think a lot of people don't think about that. Um, the fourth one is projecting guilt or using guilt to get what you want, guilt tripping. If this is something that your parents did to you, then that's something, you know, you will have been manipulated if that was something that you grew up with. And so you're likely to unwittingly pass that on to all of your primary relationships. So I know <clears throat> I've done it. I've tried to use guilt to get what I want and I don't anymore. But when I, once I recognize that that's what I was doing and realizing, oh, that's my, how my whole family operated, then it was easier to make the choice to not do it anymore. You have to recognize it first, obviously. Um, but that's a big one, guilt as a manipulation. Another form of control is stimulating jealousy, making somebody jealous to get your needs for attention met. Or maybe you're really insecure about their feelings for you, so you want to stimulate jealousy so that you can, you know, have the feeling that they really care, right? Anytime you're trying to manipulate someone's emotions to get your needs met, that's control. Um, also, if you're on the receiving end of extreme amounts of jealousy, that's actually one of the hallmarks of an abusive relationship is a really hyper-jealous dynamic. 
where everything you do makes the other person jealous and they're always wanting you not to talk to anybody else and you're always having to prove that they have no reason to be jealous and you end up feeling controlled by that. Spouses that are constantly jealous tend to be pretty controlling and it might be overt and it might be covert, but that's a major red flag. Flattery is also another thing we don't often think about, but it's definite control tactic, another way of getting traction through the other person's ego. So maybe you're not using negative emotion to get what you want, but you're using positive emotion, feeding their ego, getting them to getting on their good side so that you have more leverage. Then there's the silent treatment, which is a punitive thing to do. It's retaliation. It's a way to make the other person pay for not being controllable. <clears throat> and there's lots of other things. If you think, okay, what are the ways that I've been retaliated against? Or what are the ways that I have retaliated against my spouse? I'm sure you'll think of other things too. Withholding, um, withholding affection or using sex to get what you want, withholding sex or using sex to seduce to get what you want. Those all fall into the category of control. And caretaking, and I mentioned this earlier, doing for others what they should be doing for themselves. Um, the reason why caretaking is a slippery slope because it, it can be really helpful, right? And it's, we don't always recognize caretaking as control because it's nurturing and it's caring. But it is a slippery slope to control because by caretaking and making people lean on us so much and becoming really indispensable, we feel more needed and therefore more important, more securely attached. And then, so then it becomes, you know, it's an underhanded thing. Like it looks like we're doing it for them, but we're really doing it for ourselves. Anytime we're not really clear on what our agendas are or what our real reasons are for things or what our, what the stake is in what we're doing, then we're not being, we're not being above board. And so that can slip into that sort of covert. This definitely falls into the covert control um, maneuvers. And I also think that where it gets controlling is, is that then they owe you, right? If you're caretaking and you're doing so much for them and you're giving so much and you're always anticipating what they might need, they owe you. And if they don't do the same for you, then you're going to be mad at them. And that's not necessarily a healthy thing, obviously, especially if it's something that they should be doing themselves. And that's a sign of codependency. And then the final thing is when you go into like attacks of hysteria or rage or unbridled self-expression, that's another form of punishment, another retaliation. It's that righteous rage of feeling like I should have what I want. You're not giving it to me. And now you're going to pay for it. Now you're going to listen to me dump all over you and you deserve it, right? There's real belief in that. And you might recognize it later and say, you know what? That wasn't cool. I shouldn't have done that. That's over the line. But if you're not really looking inward to see what's going on internally for you and meeting those needs for yourself, you're going to be at risk of doing it again. I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Now, if you're listening to this and you're identifying with any of these in yourself, please do not judge yourself. You have to remember that negative control is learned in childhood. It's something that is a byproduct of our culture, like I said before, and it takes a lot of time to unlearn that. Right. And it might be something that you never really thought about until now. And now you're recognizing it and you can't know what you don't know until you know. Right. Then, you know, and you can see the light clearly, then you can make different choices. So first, forgive yourself. Don't judge yourself, but just be willing to be courageous enough to shine the light on it and, and look at like, OK, what's really going on and own it and admit it first. That's the only way forward. You have to be willing to do that in order to make different choices. The other thing that I think is helpful, another way to look at this is that it is a survival skill, right? A lot of times the reason why you are being controlling or why your spouse is being controlling is that it's something that was a conditioned attempt to get needs met and stay connected. A lot of control is about staying connected and having access <clears throat> and impact on the people that we care about because connection is such a driving force in human behavior. It's something that will drive us when we don't even realize that that's really what's going on. It comes from fear, right? When we move into control, when I think about the times that I've been controlling, it's because I'm scared. It might be because I have a lack of internalized safety. It, you know, my, my attachment wasn't secure growing up. And so control was a way to lock that down. And that doesn't really work in a healthy adult relationship. 
So, and another reason why you could be engaging in controlling behaviors could be limiting beliefs. For example, if you're perceiving everything as a sign of disrespect, or if your partner is always perceiving everything as like, you know, you must not respect me, or like if you have boundaries and they're not okay with that, or you're, you yourself are not okay. There was a time in my life with my friends where I didn't feel, I did not like it when they had boundaries because it made me feel rejected because of my limiting beliefs and associations growing up. It wasn't the case at all. So, but when you have these conditioned limiting beliefs, it will affect your filter and how you perceive what's actually happening. And then you might get threatened, right? And so control then becomes a defense against feeling excluded. It becomes a defense against feeling shut out or powerless. It's really what it's all about. And so if you can have compassion for yourself around that or compassion for your spouse around that and say, there's something positive, there's a positive impulse behind all of this. It's just that the way that it's happening is not healthy and it's not productive. Um, so let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's just say, let's throw out the bathwater. Let's keep the baby. The baby is, I want to stay connected. I want to feel included. I want to have safety in the relationship. That desire is something that we can use it towards healthy transformation. But what we need to let go of is those really, you know, dysfunctional ways of actually trying to get those needs met. The other way you can look at control issues is that underneath all of the losing strategies that you might be engaging in is a hidden dream. It could be a life dream. It could be a relationship vision that's at stake. It could be something that's super important to you that you realize if this doesn't happen in my life, then I will have regrets on my deathbed, you know? And if you realize that, that something that you're fighting for, that you're getting controlling around is that there's a life dream at stake for you. That's also something you don't want to give up on. You don't want to throw that out but we have to figure out different ways to lead with that vision in a way that's an invitation and a, and a request, but not control. <clears throat> so once I think you can look at it in these ways, you can have a lot more compassion for yourself for the positive intentions behind the behaviors. And at the same time, recognizing that these behaviors, these controlling behaviors are actually the greatest obstacle to ultimately getting what you want. It's like shooting yourself in the foot. It's a block to intimacy. It's a block to closeness. It's a block to harmony. It's a block to your future because people, nobody likes to be controlled. Nobody likes it. People resist it. People will resist it. Even if what they're asking for is something you would be happy to give, you don't want to give it. We as human beings, and this is different, you know, there's varying degrees of this depending on your personality, but it's human nature to be like, I don't want to give it if I have to. I'd rather give it because I have a choice. And when we get controlling, we're not giving people a choice. I mean, we, they always still have a choice, but it's not a fair choice in a, really, in a marriage or, you know, a significant romantic relationship for a person to have to choose between their own authenticity and integrity and adherence to their own values and remaining in connection with you. There's a way to do both. And th that's a negotiation. But when you're moving into control, you're, by you're trying to bypass the negotiation. And you're trying to say, I don't want to have to negotiate because that doesn't feel secure enough. That leaves it too open-ended. There's too much uncertainty in a negotiation. I just want to know that I can have it. And I want to bypass all the uncertainty because of my own anxiety. So anyway, once you um, are realizing that this is not going to help you get close, it's not going to help you repair, it's not going to help you go the distance in your marriage, it, it generates a huge amount of resentment. It contaminates the purity of your connection because, like I said, people don't want to be controlled. So what should you do about it? Now, this is the meat, right? If you really don't want to continue your controlling behaviors or if you want to call this out in your partner and have an honest conversation about it, here are the five steps that I want to share with you that I think are going to help you really pivot, draw a line in the sand today and say, I'm not going to do this anymore, okay? You, that's where it all starts is that decision to say, I need to do something differently. So first you have to recognize in yourself, what are you doing that is controlling? Identify those behaviors and what is at stake for you? What does something mean to you and why? Why are you trying so hard to get it? And what does it mean to you? If you don't get it, what does it mean to you to, if you do get it? You have to really know that. You can't just take, like have it be like, I just want this and that's good. That's not actually good enough if you wanna have good self-awareness. You have to know why you want it and what it means to you to have it what you think that means about you, what you think that means about your spouse, what you think that means about your, the potential of your future. 
and write it down and get really clear for yourself because it might be not totally true. And it might be that there's another meaning that we could give those things, or it might mean that you want to hang on to it, but you have to figure out a different way to get that. So, but being able to discern comes from the self-awareness that you first have to have. That's step one. Step two is commit to stopping the losing strategies that you're doing. If you know that you're being too pushy, if you know that you're nagging all the time, if you know that you're constantly micromanaging or being retaliatory because you didn't get your way, you just have to decide and commit to stopping that and saying, I'm going to learn some new ways of communicating around these things that really matter to me. That's it. Just committing. And I know that sounds really simple, but it's actually something that people don't do like people actually think about it or they think that they've committed because they thought it was a good idea. But when I'm saying committing, I'm saying you're saying no more. You're putting like a boundary on yourself <clears throat> or you're putting a boundary up if your spouse is the one that's controlling and you're saying, I won't engage in that anymore. Now, what does that look like to not engage in that anymore? That we'll get to that in a minute. But, but first you have to commit to that and say, Everything I'm going to be doing from this moment forward is going to support my success in this intention. Because if you have the intention, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to follow through. It's a decision. So then number three is you want to focus on speaking clearly about what you need and desire, make clear, clear requests, and then let go of the outcome, right? This is easier said than done, but imagine this, okay? You have to allow somebody to choose to disappoint you, or you have to allow them to pleasantly surprise you. You have to let go of control to find out, right? You have to give enough time and space to find out what's actually going to happen. So you have to give it time. Part of letting go of the outcome is giving it time to see what happens and regulate yourself in the meantime. So if you need more of a deep dive around emotional regulation, I do have some videos on that on YouTube um, about triggers and things like that. But letting go of the outcome is the main thing. And then, okay, well, what's going to come up around that? A lot of times when we engage in controlling behaviors, it's, it's actually that we're trying to defend against feelings that we have. And when we stop that, a bunch of feelings come up that now we have to face. So that's why I mentioned the emotional regulation piece. Because if we don't have that dialed in, then you won't be able to let go. You won't be able to stop the maladaptive behaviors and let go of the outcome. Step four is to proactively focus on all the things that you can control and see where you can release your partner from meeting all your needs. See what you can take care of on your own, not from a place of hyper autonomy, because that's like a trauma response, but from a place of letting go, like letting go of trying to get somebody to do something and wasting all of your energy on something that you can't control. As soon as it feels like powerlessness to let go of control of what's going on over there on their side of the street, you feel like you're just settling or, you know, not, you start to tell yourself all these kinds of uh, catastrophes or what's the word, um, catastrophic meaning making stories around what's not going to work in your relationship or how you can't take it anymore. Those kinds of things. I'm not, I think that if you can take your energy out of that, that's incredibly draining. If you can bring that back onto your side of the street and say, what can I control? What can I do? How can I respond? What thoughts can I have? What actions can I take? And what, can I, what kind of a feeling state can I move into? You can actually control that. Once you pull back from that, you will realize how much power you actually have. Way more than you think you do, but you have to first do that. And then finally, is you have to know your deal breakers and trust that when those are reached, you'll draw lines for yourself on what you're gonna participate in and what you won't. In other words, boundaries. If you know that you've got your own back around your deal breakers and you trust yourself completely, it's so much easier to let go of the outcome and see what they're going to do with your requests and to see if you're going to be able to let go of the outcome and still get most of your needs met. I think that when you know your deal breakers and you know that you can trust yourself, you can say, I can allow things to be not perfect for a little while and then see what happens because it doesn't have to be decided right now. You know when you get to that point, you'll know it, you'll honor it, you'll take care of yourself. That helps you feel more in control. It helps you feel less like you're handing your heart to someone else. Because we're not really, we're really not. We're opening our hearts to feel disappointed, but 
Disappointment is not the same thing as rejection. Disappointment is not the same thing as incompatibility or any of the other meanings that we make out of it. Just know your deal breakers, because if somebody is really crossing major deal breakers for you repeatedly and you've given and you've tried all these steps, then you may be looking at, okay, maybe I can't actually live my life dreams or my highest values with this person. And sometimes we have to choose our values over the person, unfortunately. Or fortunately, you could put it that way too. So that's it for today, you guys. If you need help around this stuff, if you want to do a deeper dive around your dynamics, please book a call. You're welcome to book a free call with us. It's either going to be with me or one of my coaches. It's monikahoyt.com forward slash talk. I'll put the link below. Book a call. I will, you know, like look at what the situation is, get a better understanding of your dynamics. Um, look at what the barriers are in your unique situation and then create a plan and make some recommendations. There's no obligation. It's a free call. So feel free to book. And if you have any questions, please put your questions in the comments below and I will go through and I will answer them. All right, you guys. Thanks for tuning in and I will see you next time.